Sure. Okay, thanks. Um, so what we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to give a lecture, hopefully it'll take an hour or a little less, um, on what's called structural variation um, it, as a, as a complement to, to what Michael just described. You can think of, uh, in some ways you can think of structural variance as really big indels, so we have big insertions of DNA or deletions or inversions or translocations. Um, so let me just skip ahead. Um, and so we're going to talk about uh, both the sequencing strategies, how we use DNA sequencing to, to identify these, uh, these types of events in, in human genomes, or in any genome for that matter. And then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the tools that we use to take the signals that we get from sequence alignments, aggregate them, and make predictions about rearrangements that might have occurred in, in chromosomes. Um, and then the practical session is going to be very much like what Michael did. We're going to walk through the same data set that uh, we were working with earlier today. But instead of finding SNPs and indels, we're going to find structural rearrangements. Okay. So the basic idea is what I want to, what I hope to convey um, is a, a basic sense of what structural variation is. I think many of you probably already have a basic sense or even very detailed sense of this already. Um, have a basic understanding of how we use sequencing technologies to identify them. Um, and to appreciate sort of the pros and cons of the three, possibly four different strategies for identifying these types of <coughs> events, as well as uh, what I call the signatures. Um, so when, when there's a structural variant, what we'll see is that there's very specific sequence alignment signatures that suggest that a deletion or an inversion or a duplication has occurred. And I hope to give you a sense of, of how to identify those signatures. Don't try and memorize them while you're in the, in the lecture. You can always refer back to the slides. Um, just, just recognize that there are signatures. Okay, so from a really high level, um, what we're talking about is you know, compared to a reference genome where we've got, say, four arbitrary segments of DNA that I've denoted A, B, C, and D. Just like single nucleotide polymorphisms and insertion deletion polymorphisms segregate in the population, so do larger structural variants. So in this case, let's say each of these segments are five kilobases in size. In this, in this chromosome, the segment B has been deleted. Uh, on this chromosome, a new segment, X, has been inserted, uh, maybe a tandem duplication of a 5 kb segment. So now this chromosome is 5 kb larger than it, than it was before the mutation. Um, you can have inversions or translocations. And I think one of the confu most confusing things about structural variation when people first get into it is it's, there's a ton of jargon, uh, and terms are sort of often used interchangeably when they shouldn't be, and people think that there's a distinction between terms when there actually isn't. So I, I thought I'd start by trying to clear up some of the terminology. First and foremost, people talk about <coughs> copy number variation and structural variation. Structural variation is a superset of copy number variation. Copy number variants are nothing more than structural variants that change the relative copy number of a given segment of DNA in, in that chromosome. So let's say a gene is duplicated. You say that gene is copy number variable because in that genome there are two copies. Maybe in the reference there were one. You also hear the term genomic rearrangements. It's, it's really just a, a fancier way of saying structural variant and possibly a more precise and less, uh, less vague way of describing it. One of the key notions that I want you to recognize is that when you have a structural variant, there are, there are so-called breakpoints, which is essentially, if you have a segment of DNA that is lost, for instance, there's a novel breakpoint or DNA junction between segment A and segment C that, didn't ex that doesn't exist in this genome. So when you compare this chromosome to this chromosome, you'll see a, a breakpoint here because it's, it's basically you line you align these two things together and there's a huge difference that is segment B is missing, so here's the breakpoint. Um, it's also called junctions, 
Um, but the term that we're going to be using uh, throughout this lecture is breakpoint. Um, and if you, if you work at all in cancer, you've probably heard or read papers talking about the, the recently more appreciated uh, level of complex structural variation that, that exists in, in cancer genomes. So most of you are probably aware that solid tumor genomes, especially one of the hallmarks of a, of a tumor genome is, is a high level of chromosomal rearrangement. It turns out that often there are complex rearrangements where within the same locus there's overlapping deletions, duplications, inversions, etc., that are very hard to explain um, through stepwise mutations. But more likely that what happened is there was some really complex, nasty rearrangement, such as chromosome shattering, which you might have heard about, that, that led to that complex structure. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, so it's, it's important to understand you know, why, why we actually care about these, why we care about structural variation. Um, first of all, they're, they're far more common than we probably believed 10 years ago. A lot of that has to do with the technology that, we, uh, that we're using. We have much greater resolution to inspect and scrutinize the structure of genomes. It turns out that rough estimate, any two of us, are diff are, our genomes differ by about two or three to 10,000 structural variants. Um, and even though you know, there's probably a million to three million to four million single nucleotide polymorphisms between our genomes, uh, that's way more than the number of structural variants. Because these structural variants are very often very large, the total number of base pairs that are affected by these mutations or these polymorphisms um, uh, is much greater than single nucleotide differences. Um, there are also, if you're interested in genome evolution and speciation, these are important, often important events in terms of speciation. You have a large inversion in a chromosome, it's very difficult to have homologous recombination because of that big inversion. Um, genome instability and aneuploidy, as I mentioned, are hallmarks of cancer. And, and really, you know, when you get into the genetic basis of traits, I think somewhat naively, we often think about you know, the markers that we use to study traits as just SNPs and just indels, or even just SNPs, these are genetic variants that actually have phenotypic consequence and, and are, in many ways, just as important as, as the type of genetic variation that we're used to thinking about when studying traits. So as I mentioned, um, our basic understanding of the landscape of, of structural variation it's really driven, like most things in this field, by the technology that we use to study it. So we've, we've known about large-scale structural variation for a long, long time. Early cytogenetic research and karyotyping showed that, you know, obviously in, you know, do chromosome uh, sorting um, and chromosome mapping, you, you see aneuploidy. Uh, techniques such as array CGH, FISH, Sky, COBRA, all these different techniques, gave us greater resolution. And then with the advent of the, the reference genome, we could design uh, microarrays to target, you know, evenly spaced across the genome to look for changes in copy number. But what we're going to focus on today is, is using DNA sequencing to really get fine scale, often base pair resolution of exactly where these rearrangements have occurred. Um, and as the sequencing technologies get higher and higher throughput and the sequencing reads get longer and longer, it turns out that it's, it's easier and easier, thankfully, to, to map structural variants with, with fairly high confidence. But one thing I should just say from the very beginning is that uh, the pipeline that Michael took you through to identify SNPs and indels, the state-of-the-art in SNP and indel calling is far more sophisticated than the state of the art in structural variant detection. Um, we're going to walk through a fairly simple workflow. Uh, you know, it's easy to run the commands. It's just that I'll talk about this more later. The false positive and false negative rates in structural variant calling are substantially higher, probably an order or an order and a half higher than of magnitude higher than for SNP and indel calling. And hopefully, you'll understand why that is. So 
as I mentioned, let's just define what a breakpoint is. Um, remember that we're taking sequencing data from an experimental sample, and just like identifying SNPs and indels, what we're actually doing is we have to align that data to the reference genome. So we reveal structural variants by comparison to the gospel, the reference genome, right? So when we do that, if there's a, if there's a deletion of segment D, E, F, G in our experimental genome, we'll call it test, this is the breakpoint. This is the novel junction in the test genome. So there's now a novel junction between C and H as a result of this deletion. But there's actually two breakpoints in the reference genome. So there's often confusion about what people mean when they talk about the breakpoint or the breakpoints. Are they talking about the breakpoints in the, in the experimental genome or the reference genome? Um, and conversely, if there were an insertion of this DNA in the, in the test genome, there would be two breakpoints in the test genome and one in the reference genome. So this confusion um, led the, the, the people that define the VCF format that Michael taught you about um, VCF format can also represent structural variants. And to distinguish breakpoints in the test genome versus breakpoints in the reference genome, um, I guess novel adjacencies are the new breakpoints in the test genome. So this would be a novel adjacency breakpoint. And these are break ends. So more jargon, but you can refer back to it. So let's just get a high level sense of what these patterns look like. Um, I mean, if you literally just sat down and drew a sequence and inverted it and mapped these breakpoints, you'd be able to recapitulate all of this. But if we had a deletion in the test genome, which just sh showed, we have a novel adjacency in, between C and H because of this deletion of D, E, F, and G. Now, if it's an inversion in the test genome, as you can see, that there's two novel adjacencies in the test genome. There's a novel adjacency between C and G and between D and H because of the inversion of that block. Here's some more patterns. So if there's a tandem duplication, there's a there's one, one new breakpoint um, or novel adjacency in the test genome. And if there's a if there's a new insertion of some DNA from another chromosome, for instance. Let's imagine this is another chromosome. So this, maybe this is chromosome 1 and this is chromosome 10. Segment X from chromosome 10 gets inserted into chromosome 1 in the test genome. So when you actually try to map that breakpoint, you can see all this, all this sequence is going to align to chromosome 1. This is going to align to chromosome 1, but this little bit is going to align to chromosome 10. Sorry, I'm not using a pointer because I have a terrible habit of occasionally shooting people in the eye with a laser, so I thought I'd, I'd, I'd hold off. Um, and so if there's a recipro reciprocal translocation between two chromosomes, very similarly, we don't have to walk through this, but basically you get these reciprocal exchanges in the breakpoint. So, you know, chromosome one to chromosome two, I guess in this case, you get these reciprocal patterns. Now, the ultimate goal for mapping chromosomal rearrangements, obviously, would be to take every sample genome that you have, whether it's human or bacteria or whatever, do complete and accurate de novo assembly, have your new complete genome, and just align the two genomes. That's the ultimate goal. Um, for mammalian genomes, we're, we just really can't do it yet, primarily because the sequences aren't long enough, and there's just, as you probably know, the human genome is highly repetitive. Um, so in the interim, until we can do that, we use uh, several different strategies. Um, first is using read depth. Um, we'll go into this in more detail. We can also use a strategy called paired end mapping. I'll talk about that a bit more and also split read or split contig mapping. Um, so let's go into each of those in a little bit more detail. So just a high level cartoon schematic of what these different strategies are. The first two steps are the same, and it's basically the same two steps as you did with Michael in terms of identifying SNPs and indels. You take your FASTQ files, 
you align them to the reference genome with BWA or Nova line or Mosaic or whatever. And essentially, just like you're trying to find SNPs, you're looking for some signal that is a different, that represents a difference between your test genome and the reference genome. It's just in this case, because we're looking for structural variants, that signal is different. And unfortunately, it's just a little more difficult to, to separate this signal from noise. Um, one strategy for doing this is called depth of coverage, where conceptually, let's say the reference genome has this green block, but it's been deleted in this experimental genome, so that this is the breakpoint of the deletion. So if that's true, when you align DNA from the experimental genome to the reference genome, you're going to get coverage upstream of, or up or downstream of the, of the breakpoint of this region and downstream as well. And you'll have a gap in coverage owing to the fact that that segment of DNA was actually deleted in your sample. You can also use paired-end mapping where uh, I'm not sure how familiar. Does everyone know what paired-end sequencing is? Yeah? Anyone not? Okay. So paired end sequencing, we've sequenced, let's say this is a 500 base pair fragment of DNA. We've sequenced 100 base pairs on one end, 100 base pairs on the other end. The unsequenced portion actually straddles the breakpoint. So when you do that, let's say this is a 5 kb segment again. We know that these two ends are 500 base pairs apart, roughly, because of the library that we you know, that's the, that's the size that we cut out of our gel. When we align these to the reference genome, we're going to find that, aha, this end and this end are now 5,500 base pairs apart. So it's like a, a too big alignment, which suggests that uh, there is actually a deletion of about 5,000 base pairs in this genome. Similarly, split read mapping is essentially the same concept, except that we've actually sequenced through the rig. In this case, this is the unsequenced portion. In this case, let's say we have a nice 500 base pair contiguous DNA sequence, and we've actually sequenced right through the breakpoint. So this half of the sequence is going to line here, and this half is going to line here. And as I mentioned, the end all be all would be to do de novo assembly, and there there are. There are some, are some hybrid strategies where, you know, it's maybe not possible to do it on the whole genome, um, but you could use one of these strategies to find signals for structural variation. Basically, then extract the DNA surrounding that region and do local de novo assembly to build contigs that can be then aligned to the reference genome to map these, these events with fairly high precision. Okay, so let's, let's go into a little more detail about um, how we use read depth or depth of coverage to give us, to infer that some sort of change in, in structural variation has occurred. But the important point to mention here is that all this tells us, we can only use this method to find deletions or duplications. If it's inversion, that's a so-called balanced rearrangement, there's no change in copy number, right? There's no DNA loss or DNA gain. It's just been swapped. Okay, so here's just here's a, uh, an example from a data set that we have in my lab. Um, Match tumor nor tumor normal pair. Um, on the top is this is this is an IGV view zoomed way out. So all these little gray ticks are individual sequence alignments. So as you see that on the top, the, the coverage in the normal is fairly uniform, and there's some difference here in the tumor. Can anyone guess what, what that is? <laughs> what? <laughs> there's, there's more DNA, so it's, it's, a, it's a duplication. So the, in the tumor genome, there's been a duplication, essentially, of this segment. We don't know where it's duplicated. It might be tandemly duplicated. It might be duplicated on another chromosome. But essentially, that, that chunk of DNA that's in the reference genome occurs more than, more than two times in the, in the, refer in the tumor genome. So, the, so the really, it's a very simple strategy. You, you align all your data to the reference genome. And you could imagine, we just, we just create a window, a sliding window across each chromosome. And we just march along and we ask, 
what's the how many reads are in this chunk? How many reads are in this chunk? How many reads are in this chunk? And it's the same. It's, it's basically consistent. And all of a sudden, we see a chunk where there's a lot more DNA, another chunk where there's a lot more DNA, another chunk of the genome where there's more DNA. We can integrate those signals across different windows along each chromosome to say, well, it looks like there's more DNA consistently in this region. This, this looks like a duplication. Um, the problem is that there's, there are many reasons when, why you can have fluctuation in coverage um, that has nothing to do with um, changes in the actual amount of DNA in your sample. The, first, the, the most significant of which is GC bias. So some of these, some of these technologies have, it, it's less so now, but uh, you know, three years ago when I was working really hard on this, these kind of techniques, GC bias was a big issue. So you basically, before you do this counting uh, uh, by marching window, uh, sliding windows across chromosomes to identify changes in coverage, you first have to normalize that coverage by the GC content in that region. Excuse me. Yeah. What do you mean by CNAs? Mm. Copy number alterations. So um, yet another term for the same damn thing. Okay. Um, it's just another way of saying copy number variant. It's, it's my attempt to confuse you more than you might have already been. Did I succeed? Okay, good. Um, so here's another plot of uh, a larger region um, of, a, of an entire chromosome. And you know this, this is basically just showing you that you can identify, when you compare normal to tumor, you can identify deletions and duplications. And not only that, you can actually start to get into predicting what the actual copy number is, right? So it's one thing to just say there was a deletion or there was a duplication. Um, especially for duplications, it's somewhat important to understand, well, how many more copies are there? Uh, and so this is basically saying, you know, this is our expected 2N, our diploid coverage. Maybe this is 1N. Maybe this is 3N, 4N. So the strengths of this strategy are that conceptually it's, it's very simple to get. I mean, if you had even the most basic scripting abilities, you could, you could get at this problem pretty quickly. You, just, you would use something like SAM tools like Michael introduced or a, this program bed tools that, that we maintain to just march across windows in the genome, count up reads, and just compare the counts in these windows between two states. Um, so it's e pretty easy to identify gene amplifications or deletions. Um, and, but, but the problem is that it, it's fairly low resolution. Um, because we're creating windows across the genome, we need those windows to have a statistically relevant number, on, a, on average, have a statistically relevant number of reads in them. So let's, for, for example, let's say we only had 5x coverage of our genome. So we got, a, you know, 50 million reads. If we create a window size of 10 base pairs, we want, we want to be able to detect 10 base pair deletions or duplications. On average, we've probably got three, four, five reads in those windows. So if you compare a window with four reads to a window with six reads in another sample, does that is that really evidence that there's a 50% gain in coverage? So the, the, main, the main point is that we want our window size to be big enough such that maybe the median number of reads in a window is, say, 100 or 200 uh, reads so that we have some statistical power to detect differences. And the size of that window to get that number of reads is a function of how much coverage you have. Right? So that's why in this slide back here, saying you know the resolution is is fairly low but the cost is pretty low because you could actually maybe sequence 5 10x coverage of your genome but if you make your windows 50 kb you're going to have pretty statistical strong statistical power to detect uh, deletions or duplications in 50 kb windows downside is your resolution is only 50 kb okay so high-level uh, workflow of how you actually correct for um, GC bias. So on the, on the top in blue is the actual read counts 
for a 12 megabase region on chromosome 17. So if we didn't know anything about GC bias in these windows, we would, we would guess that maybe on the far right there's a big duplication there, and maybe right here in the middle there's a deletion. However, if you just simply map GC, the GC bias along that same chromosome, what you see um, is you know, the, the coverage actually tracks fairly well with GC bias along the, along the GC content along the chromosome. So when you basically correct that coverage for the GC content, what you get is something much cleaner. And what you find is that you know, this, this thing that looked like a deletion before is actually not a deletion. It tracks perfectly with GC content. Whereas this duplication over here seems to be real because it's, it's much higher than the, than the fluctuation the GC content in that region. So essentially, you take your counts for the same windows that you looked at, you compute the GC content in those windows, and essentially just normalize um, your counts by the distribution of counts for all the windows in the genome that had that same GC content. Okay, and then once you have that, you can just plot it. You can use basically a number of standard deviations or z-scores to, to, to basically predict whether or not there's statistical significance for that change in, in DNA content. Yeah? I'm wondering, you know, say you did something fairly 50-50, like AC, AC, AC repeated a thousand times. Yep. So... So basically, if it's a very, so the one consequence of this effect is that if you have very, very high GC content in a given window, there are very, probably very few windows like that in the genome. So there's not a lot, the, the statistical power, uh, the, the st statistical precision of the distribution for that GC content being, say it's like 70% GC, there's probably only 20 windows like that, just picking a number. So when you're plotting, when you're taking the actual read count for a window with that GC content, um, the, the statistic, the distribution is going to be very, very rough. So you probably don't have quite as, the Z, and so the standard deviation is going to be very high. So it'd be very tough to pick out a, a duplication or a deletion from windows like that. Um, but, you know, in the 45 to 55 percent GC spectrum, you have high power because there's a lot of windows in the genome that have roughly that GC content. So this is really just a, a pretty slide of, of a normal versus two different tumors and so showing how, just through this basic depth of coverage analysis, after GC correction, how crazy duplicated and deleted and rearranged some tumor genomes can be. And we'll see this in more detail later. So really high level, all you need to remember is that if you want to just find deletions and duplications, so gene losses, gene gains, um, you can do it fairly cheaply with not terribly high coverage of a genome. The consequence is that you don't have very high resolution to know exactly where the DNA, the deletion occurred. But you know sort of the rough maybe 50 kb or 100 kb window where it, where it occurred. Yeah. Yeah. Um, depends on the depends on the cancer type and whether you know how the severity of it. I mean, there the karyotypes for some cancers are insane. So no, I mean, I, I think this is could be very. I mean, I know this in this case it's real, but knowing actually what you know the problem with this is you don't know what genes are affected. You don't know anything about the underlying biology, and you don't really know the structure of the chromosomes. You just know that there's lots of places. In the reference genome, where there's more DNA or less, whole genome, that's the entire genome. So from here to here, it's chromosome one, chromosome two, et cetera. So 
Right, so compared to the normal, um, maybe, you know, normal is 2n. You know, here, it's like, let's pick one, chromosome 13 is, looks like 1n on average. Right. And so if you actually subtracted out the normal where you see those big spikes, this would look different. This is these are raw raw counts. So um, as I said, it's fairly easy, fairly cheap, low resolution. So we're going to move on to paired end mapping, which I talked about a little bit. It's also called read pair analysis, um, but I think the consensus term in the field is, is paired end mapping. The central concept in paired end mapping is that when you're doing paired end sequencing, you're size selecting the fragments that you're in a sequence. So you, the idea is that you know what a normal fragment should look like. So if you if you sonicated or nebulized your DNA and you, you're looking for a 500 base pair fragment library, and you sequence the ends, maybe the 100 base pairs on either end of those fragments, there's, there's 300 base pairs of unsequenced DNA in the middle of that fragment. So let's imagine our fragment distribution, the actual fragments that we that we put into our sequencer, the distribution that looks like this. So this is a very nice library. It's, it's a, a pretend library. But you know, maybe, maybe on the upper bound, it's at 600 base pairs and 400 base pairs on the lower bound. So the idea is that this is what our normal alignment should look like. And the corollary is, therefore, any alignments where the two ends you know, are way out here or way out here, that's pretty strong evidence that there's something weird going on. There's some sort of rearrangement. But the only way with paradigm mapping that we will, we will see that abnormal mapping distance is if the breakpoint in your um, experimental genome is in this unsequenced portion of the fragment. Okay? So the way we do this, let's, let's say 400 or 500 base pair fragments, it doesn't matter. Just like you did with Michael when you align with BWA MEM or BWA or whatever. You're going to line both ends, so you have two FASTQ files, N1 and N2. You're going to end up with a SAM file or a BAM file where you know 50, you had 50 million fragments, you had 50 million alignments to the genome. And what you find, is for human, typically 97, 98% of those paired end sequences align as you would expect to the reference genome. That is, with the Illumina technology, the leftmost end is in forward orientation, the rightmost is in negative orientation, and the reverse orientation. And the distance between those two ends is, is roughly what you'd expect based on the library that you generated. So in many ways, with paired end mapping, you throw away about 97% of your data from the get-go. And you're just focusing on the so-called discordant alignments. So there's alignments that are too big, so it's you know 5,500 base pairs apart, like we talked about before. That suggests a deletion in the test genome. Maybe they have goofy orientations. You expect forward reverse. It's actually reverse forward. That's that's evidence of another of another type of rearrangement. Um, and maybe they have the same orientation: forward forward or reverse reverse. So each of these different patterns, these these are the alignment patterns that we're looking for. And each of these different patterns suggest a different type of rearrangement. When it's too big, too far apart, it suggests a deletion in your test genome. We've gone over this. Um, if it's reverse, um, if it's reverse forward when it aligns to the reference genome, that suggests a tandem duplication. Forward, forward, reverse, reverse suggests an inversion. If you draw all these out, I mean, it, you, you can see why it is. Um, so paired end mapping tools that are trying to find structural variants, essentially what they're doing is screening across the genome and trying to find clusters of alignments that look like this. And so if you just have one, you don't really, you might not believe that there's a structural variant because you can have chimeric molecules when you're doing your library prep that would lead to weird alignments. But if you start seeing it over and over and over again, 
just like when you're trying to do SNP discovery, you want to see it in more than one read to believe it's not just sequencing error. And you start to see clusters of these alignments. Um, sorry. We we believe that it's actual an actual event. And and you know how many how many discordant alignments you require really depends upon how how what the false discovery rate you're looking for is and how much coverage you have, et cetera. So um, when I was doing my postdoc, there were there was a, a wild competition to make the latest and greatest uh, paradigm mapper. Just like there's 700 sequence aligner, short read aligners out there. It's not quite that many structural variant colors or paradigm mapping colors, but there's a lot. Um, the one that I wrote as a postdoc is called Hydra. That's what we're going to use today. Uh, it's a really nice one called Delhi from Jan Corbell's lab that uh, is used pretty extensively in the Thousand Genomes project. Ben Raphael's lab at Brown. They've got a really nice tool called Gatsby Pro. And one that we're going to talk about in a little bit is called uh, Lumpy from, from my lab and Ira Hall's lab. Um, they're all fairly easy to run, basically give the same type of results. Um, some excel at different types of structural variants more than others. The main reason I'm recommending these is because they're fairly easy to run. Some of the more obscure tools are more difficult to install, kind of painful to understand the output, and often fail. Um, so we talked about um, the different rules for paradigm mapping signatures. We can skip this. Um, the thing I want to focus on is reciprocal translocations. The first, the slides preceding us were basically duplicates. Um, in the case of a reciprocal translocation, I'm not sure how many people here are working at studying cancer, but you probably know a lot of leukemias are characterized by a canonical reciprocal tr translocation. For instance, for instance, the BCRA will uh, translocation. Um, so, whereas the reference genome, so here's chromosome, one chromosome and another chromosome, let's, let's say there is a reciprocal exchange between these two chromosomes in the test genome, what we're going to get are two different breakpoints, one on this chromosome and one on the other, and the alignment, so when we align this end, so essentially when we look at this data, this is a given paired end sequence, this end is going to align actually to that chromosome in the reference genome, and this end is going to align to this chromosome in the reference genome. And then what we'll see, the way you identify a reciprocal translocation is by essentially looking for an, a reciprocal event that suggests overlap with the, with the same region of the two chromosomes. So that leads you to believe that there was a reciprocal exchange of DNA. Okay. So split read mapping is the third technology uh, strategy that I'll talk about, and it, it's very sim similar in concept to paradigm mapping. So I think the, the easiest way to think about this is, let's take the deletion example again, where you have a segment B in the reference genome that has been deleted in your sample genome. So that now there's this novel junction between segments A and C. If you had a paired end sequence that spanned that, when you align it to the reference genome, and one is going to be is going to align to segment A, and two is going to align to segment C, and there's going to be this much greater than expected distance between the two ends, right? And that is because the breakpoint is actually was in this unsequenced portion of the paired end fragment. But what if what if the breakpoint was actually in the, let's say we had a 500 base pair read, or even a 100 base pair read for that matter, what if the breakpoint was actually in the middle of this one sequence end? So that's what's depicted here. The sequence actually spans that breakpoint, so you're going to get half of the alignment to this part of the reference genome, and half to this part of the reference genome, let's say, five, to keep with our example, 5,000 base pairs in between. Okay? And just like paradigm mapping, there's very specific orientations that, that, lead, that lead you to believe that this is a deletion. So in this case, we would require that this alignment and this alignment are on the same strand. Right? If it's a real deletion, you shouldn't have mixed strands. And for 
for split for an, a duplication, it, it's basically the same thing. Um, we just we have these two ends aligning disjoint disjointly, but the orientations are different. Um, so really, the the main difference between split read mapping and paired end mapping is that the resolution of the breakpoints that we identify is one base pair, right? So we actually can nail these breakpoints down to the exact two base pairs that form that junction. Whereas in paired end mapping, because we have this variability in our fragment sizes, even when we integrate multiple discordant alignments, we still, we often have narrowed down the breakpoint to on the order of two to 500 base pairs. Whereas with split, so if you complement these two strategies, um, you have much greater power to not only detect structural variance, but actually nail down exactly where the breakpoints are, which is really important for trying to understand the functional consequence of the, of the events. Okay, so now we're just going to um, talk a little bit about how many uh, different genetic structural variants there are in human genomes and how that compares to different types of genetic variation. And then we're just going to, we're going to look at some real world examples with real data. So we all, we learned with Michael, we learned about how to identify SNPs and indels in human genomes. Um, you know, obviously the big difference here is structural variants are, are just big, bigger events that vary not only in state, but also in size. Um, and in contrast to the SNPs, which you know, is typically about 3 million per genome, we're only talking about 3,000 um, structural variants per genome, and maybe 300,000 indels. Um, as I mentioned, it's fairly straightforward now, thanks to great tools like GATK and SAM tools and Freebase and all the tools that Michael talked about to find um, SNPs. It's still a work in progress to find indels, and the tools that we'll talk about uh, that we'll use today are to find structural variants. That's, that's sort of the hardest problem. And the main reason is um, because not only do these, these types of genetic variants vary in state, some people have the rearrangement, sometimes they don't, um, but they vary in size. And not only that, uh, they tend to occur in more repetitive parts of the genome. So there's this intrinsic difficulty in mapping these events because they're in repetitive parts of the genome. So here's a couple examples of a real um, of real events. So this is this is a deletion, um, and what the key. So this is an IGV shot of a de deletion. The gray bars are our concordant alignment. Right. And so what IGV does is it marks alignments that are discordant. And you define discordancy by telling it what you think is too big of an alignment. So that, that requires some knowledge about your fragment, this fragment size distribution of the library that you sequenced. And that's what we're going to work on in the practical sessions, how we figure out what those numbers should be. But let's say we told IGV, mark anything red that is greater than 1,000 base pairs. So all these alignments, it's buddy, the other end, maybe, maybe these two ends go together. They're from the same fragment. Um, they're 1,500 base pairs apart. So not only is this a deletion, but what kind of a deletion do you think it is? So this is a diploid genome. Hmm? Right. It's a homozygous deletion because there's no DNA in between. If it was a hemizygous deletion, we'd see this pattern, but we should also see, you know, let's just call this as the average coverage flanking region. Maybe we'd see it up here to say that there was, there was actually one intact chromosome without the del deletion, and then one with it. But clearly there's no coverage, so this is a homozygous deletion. So, so sorry, typically a human genome's got a few thousand deletions. The most common type of, of structural variant is a deletion. There's a few hundred duplications. So here's a case where, again, there's a duplication, but it's marking these, these alignments as 
discordant, not because of the alignment distance, but because of the orientation. We expect with a Illumina paired end library, the leftmost end to be forward, the rightmost end to be reverse, but it's the opposite here. We got reverse forward, and if you skip back a few slides, you'll see that re reverse forward, that signature suggests a tandem duplication. And in fact, not only do we see the, the paired end mapping signature of a duplication, but we see the excess coverage as well. Yeah? Does that mean that like for each uh, here, they map multiple times? Mm. So what's missing from this view, um, at the time that I made these slides, this technology that I'm about to describe didn't exist. But what's missing from this view is being able to connect end one with its buddy over here, end two. So let's just pretend these two go together, and these two go together, and these two go together. So it's not multiple mapping. It's just I'm not, ab I'm not able to draw for you the connections between these ends of the paired end fragments. The what number? Ah, so, so let's take a simple example. Uh, can you guys over, are you, can you see from this angle? Yeah? Okay. Um, let's just take the reference genome. Let's say it has... Right, so let's say segment B was duplicated. When you sequence this genome, there's just two times as much DNA for that segment. So when you align it to the reference genome, segment A is going to look like that, segment C is going to look like that, but now it's two, two times more. Okay? Yeah? Because they're going the wrong way, how do you know it's not an inversion? So an inversion is going to give a different pattern, and that's actually the next slide, so thank you. Um, the, so an inversion is going to look like this where um, let's, let's skip back for a second and refer to one of the earlier slides. If I can figure out how to get my mouse over here. Ugh. I have an inversion. Yes. OK. So this is the paired end signature for an inversion. So reference genome looks like A, B, C, D, but the experimental genome is A, C, B, D. So B and C have been inverted, right? So there's a new breakpoint here, and there's a new breakpoint here. When your paired end sequences span that, think, think about what's going to happen. This end is going to be forward strand, but when this end aligns to the reference genome, it's going to align like that. So it's also going to be forward strand. Because that, that piece in the reference genome is actually, let's say these are 5 kb blocks, it's actually 5 kb down, and it's all, because it's inverted, it's also going to be in forward strand. And then uh, for this break point, it's the exact opposite. This is on reverse orientation as we'd expect. But when, you, when we align to the other end, you're going to get, it's going to be a reverse orientation. So the signature for an inversion is forward, forward on the left side of the gene, downstream of the genome, and reverse, reverse. So, and they must overlap like this. So if you, let me just show you the real data. exactly what you see here. Issue is that, again, can't connect the dots. So here's your four cluster of forward alignments. Their buddies are, ugh, it's hard to look at. There's some forward ones here. You might be able to see it better on the, on the printout. But then also there's some reverse alignments here, and their buddies are right here. So you got forward, for, reverse, reverse, and then forward, forwards, suggesting that you know, the re rearrangement, the inversion is right there. Does that make sense? If you, if you sit down and draw it, like actually draw it out with a sequence, it'll, I think it'll become clear. There's a lot of mental 
DNA gymnastics that you have to do and just looking at these patterns to, to uh, make sense of them. So the other thing that, that's fairly common in the human genome is probably all familiar with retrotransposition, uh, line elements, sign elements in our earlier form of the human genome were really, really active. So a lot of the repeat content and the reference genome is, is generated from retro retrotransposition. And they are actually segregating polymorphic variants in the genome. So some people have, for instance, here's a case where the reference genome has this line element. Sequencing this, this individual, um, clearly there's a loss of coverage. And so the, the idea is that, well, the, this reference genome doesn't have the line element in it. The, the, the reason I'm making this distinction is that you look at this signature, and what would you think it is? A, it looks like a deletion in the way we've been talking about it, right? But if you think about the mechanism, it's actually not a deletion. Retrotransposition is a copy-paste event. So it's really just the reference genome had this in ins an insertion, really, and, the re and our experimental genome didn't have it. Now, I'm one, I bet some people are probably scratching their heads as to why you have all these other alignments there. Um, I think, Michael, you talked about mapping quality, right? So one of, the, one of the things that goes into mapping quality is not only the quality of the local sequence alignment, how many mismatches there were, but it also is a, is a signal or an indicator for how many alternate locations in the genome there were that were almost as good. Line elements are everywhere in the genome. They're often highly, highly identical. So the, all, these, all these sequences here, the sequence aligner chose to, to place them here, but the color indicates that there's very high uncertainty reflected in the mapping quality, that this is the right place for this alignment. So there's coverage here, but this is just coverage that's randomly distributed by the aligner among all the line elements in the genome that are just like this. Does that make sense? Yeah. With that, with that coverage there. Is it because the purple bits are lining up with the other purple bits? Is yes. So again, it's it's the the call on top connects the dots. So basically, that's the Hydra. This that's the tool we're going to use that integrates the signal from all these alignments. But what you can't see is that this end connects with the other end just in the, in the same way that that red call on top is. Okay. So why did the software program throw all those little empty boxes in, in, in that space just because there was nothing there, because there was a deletion? So um, there, are, there are a couple ways to handle this issue of, of sequences having multiple places in the genome to align. One is to ignore them completely and don't choose any of the spots. Just say, ah, this is repetitive. I don't want to touch that and not even report it in the output. That was an early, that, so in that case, we see nothing here. The other is to align that sequence to every single place in the genome that it could align, uh, given the uh, alignment parameters that you've used. The other option is just to choose one of those locations randomly, which has been done here. Let's say there are 100 equally good places to align these sequences to align elements like this. It chooses one randomly. So these, these reads, they're, all the 99 other places in the genome look just like this. They have this random scattering of sequence alignments. And then you use the mapping quality to reflect, hey, by the way, I, ref I align the sequence here, but there were roughly 99 other places in the reference genome that it could have gone. So don't really, I put the data here, but you shouldn't really trust it. Okay. Yeah. Can you look at one of those other line locations and you'd still see a loss of coverage because this element was missing? You just wouldn't see this as square of hairs on each other? Sure, but the signal for that is so minimal because there's so many copies, right? So it's, it's a difference of 90, maybe it's a difference of 99 out of 100 versus 100 out of 100. But would you see a, a similar level of loss of coverage? Yes, yes.
but but it's a it's one out of a hundred that's the distribute that's distributed among all hundred. Yeah. Um, so how do you how do you know that this is an insertion in the reference and not the So it's simply it's simply because we know we we're inferring this right because we know the the UCSC genome browser, for instance, tells us that there's a line element in the reference genome here. Line elements we know. Um, copy and move about the genome through retrotransposition through a copy and paste mechanism. So when they move, they don't exact themselves from the genome, they copy themselves. So therefore, we infer that because it looks like a deletion in our experimental genome and there's a line element here, it probably wasn't actually a deletion in, the, in our experimental genome. It's really just that the reference genome has it, we don't. The main the main reason for thinking about that is that you know you might interpret the functional consequence of this thing that looks like a deletion very differently than if it overlapped uh, you know five exons of a gene and it looks like a real deletion. Another question: uh, In some bacteria, there are uh, insertion sequences that are used for gene targeting. Mm -hmm. Is there a way from the whole genome sequencing from the to know how many copies a particular strain has compared? And where are they inserted? So right now, as you said, all of my data is just randomly gets a tool. So basically, it tells me it has the same as a reference genome, which I know. Right. So you want to compare multiple strains, not right. to the reference genome, but comparing. Right. So, well, I mean, one thing you could do is align all of them to the reference genome and then look for look for differences in, in the events in the individual strains. Because you, you could call rearrangements in each strain individually and then compare the sets to find ones that are private to one strain versus the other. Does that answer your question or no? Oh, I don't know how to do it. Maybe we can talk afterwards and, and come up with a solution. So the last, um, well, the last two are a little more esoteric, so we'll go through them fairly quickly. but. Just like, just like you can have retrotransposition events that are in the reference genome and not in the sample, you can also have retrotransposition events that are in the sample and not the reference genome. So the way you detect this, this is something that Michael worked on when he was a PhD student, and the, the lab that we both came from works on this pretty actively. Is you make the signal for this is you have let's so let's say we're on chromosome one. There's all this discordant alignment here, and it's all over the place. So there's different colors, and these different colors reflect alignments to different chromosomes. So each chromosome gets a different color. So there's something crazy going on here. And what we can find, what we find is if we look at the alignments on, the, on these other chromosomes, we can see that consistently those alignments overlap with line elements, every one of them. It's just line elements in different, part, different genomes parts of the genome. So we can use that to infer that ah, actually there is an insertion of a line element in the reference genome here um, just by the fact that uh, the, these, these aberrant alignments consistently align to the same class of line element. So this is one of the challenging parts of structural variation. It's a repetitive sequence that was inserted. So when you align these fragments to the reference genome, one end is going to align in this spot, and the other end is going to align to the 5,000 other places in the genome where that uh, line element is found just like the one that was inserted. So there are a couple different strategies for doing that. Um, I came up with one that isn't great. That's what's reflected here in the, in the, la the lab where Michael and I did our PhD, came up with a better strategy, which is just align these sequences to the known list of uh, repeat sequences, and you can you can you can identify the same thing far more quickly and far more accurately. So basically, the, the main point here is we've got an insertion of a retro, we have a retrotransposition event that, have, that occurred in the sample genome and it isn't found in the reference genome. The last, the last case is a, a, is a little more complicated where you can have <coughs> retroposed genes. So the same machinery that allows retrotransposons to insert, you can basically have um, processed uh, 
process pseudogenes that basically insert into the reference into the experimental genome. So you, you know that uh, you get these clusters of um, things that look like deletions, but what you notice is they all coincide with different exon combinations in this gene annotation, which suggests that you actually had a messenger RNA that was inserted into your test genome. It was you know, turned into DNA and inserted into the reference genome. So when you align sequences from that, that inserted event to the reference genome, you're going to get this pattern of all the different exon junctions that align to the reference genome. So the gene was, was inserted through um, retrotransposition machinery. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty rare. It's just a fun one to look at. And, you know, it took us a while to figure out what the heck was going on with these. Um, yeah. So obviously, and this varies by genome. So this is, this is a mouse example. So retrotransposition happens much more commonly. It's still active in the mouse genome. It's probably a very rare event in the human genome. So hard to find out where this really is. Yeah, exactly. We just we just know there was an insertion somewhere in the genome, but we don't know where. It's just aligning to the to the gene whose messenger RNA was reverse complemented and put it in, put into the test genome. We have no idea where it is, but we'd have to use, like you said, maybe pair of sequencing to do that. Okay, so the the last little bit that I'm going to focus on um, is going through some of the dirty secrets of structural variation discovery, a little bit of cancer work that we've done. And then at the end, I, I put some slides in uh, around this lumpy structural variant tool that we've we developed. I'm not going to go through that. You're feel free to look, uh, look through the slides. It explains what it does. In the interest of time, I'll just focus on um, talking about sort of the dirty secrets of structural variant discovery. And we've kind of touched on some of these problems already. So one is that unlike SNP and indel calling, structural variant discovery suffers from a pretty high false positive rate. And there's a lot of reasons for this, right? So our signal, our signal for structural variants is um, discordant alignments. The problem is that there are multiple reasons why you can have discordant alignments beyond re just you know, the real biological signal we're looking for, which is structural variation. First is that the human genome is really re is very repetitive, um, and despite hard, hard work to make the reference assembly perfect, there are still parts of the genome that are poorly assembled. So a lot of times what you end up finding as structural variants in these studies is actually not a structural variant, it's just misassembly in the reference genome. And the way you identify those cases is if you start seeing this structural variant in basically every sample that you sequence, tells you, ah, well, this is actually is not a polymorphism. It's just the reference genome screwed up. Um, fortunately, the, the reference genome is very high quality. So I mean, this doesn't happen all over the place. But certainly, centromeres, telomeres, and some of the highly segmentally duplicated parts of the human genome are, are not well assembled yet. Um, chimeras. So when you're doing library prep and you do adapter ligation and all these ligation steps, you can end up at a certain rate, ligating DNA fragments together. And so when you sequence, you just got two random pieces of DNA that are together. So they're going to align to crazy places in the reference genome. Um, and if you have a high duplication rate in your library, you end up duplicating these chimeras so that they look like real structural events. We require, to call a structural event, I said we require a few, you know, several discordant alignments to make us believe it's real. Well, if you have a high chimerism rate and a high duplication rate, you don't have a very complex library, you're going to artifactually get a lot of um, fake looking structural variants. And so that's where knowing, knowing what your DNA library looks like and, and you know, what the duplication rate is, what the chimerism rate is ahead of time really helps you um, choose appropriate thresholds when you're calling structural variants. So, so basically, the take-home message is that pretty much every paper, deep in the methods or in the supplemental methods that, that look at structural variants, there's, there's a list of filters that they've applied to exclude artifacts. We all do it. It's just simply to get down, get a list of 40,000 structural variant predictions in a, in a human genome down to the three to 10,000 that are probably real. 
the vast majority of things that are excluded are events in misassembled parts of the genome. Unfortunately, there's also a high false negative rate, and that's really a function, that false negative rate is primarily a function of the coverage you have in your genome, right? So if you, to get around some of the false positive issues, if you require, say, four or five discordant alignments to believe that something is real, well, you're going to throw, you're going to miss inherently all the events that are real but only had four or three or two or one discordant alignments. Right. So the higher the coverage you have, the lower your false negative rate is, but there's a cost associated with that. And if you're doing this on a whole genome scale, you're sort of balancing how much money you want to spend to get great coverage versus what your false positive and false negative rates are. Um, so the other thing is, it's just sort of this irony that the misassembled and highly repetitive parts of the genome are where a lot of the false positives are. But actually, these highly repetitive parts of the genome actually are where a lot of the action for structural variation is. So you're throwing them out to avoid misassembly, but you're probably also throwing away things that are real. It's just really hard to tell for sure that they're real. So there's, there's false negatives in the sense just built into the, into the misassemblies in the, in the reference genome. Same thing. When we do the filtering I just talked about for false positives, you always inevitably throw out false or true positives. That's the same issue with the, the strategies that Michael was talking about, VQSR and all these strategies. You're trying to focus in on a low false positive rate, but inevitably you're throwing out true positives as well. So, all right. So, in terms of false negatives um, and false positives, it's a real concern for studies like tumor normal comparisons where maybe you're trying to identify rearrangements that somatic rearrangements that occur just in the tumor. The way you do that is by essentially by comparing the evidence in the tumor versus the evidence in the normal but a lot of, a lot of the early studies went for deeper coverage in the tumor to find lots of things, sacrifice money on getting coverage in the normal so falsely concluded that there was a lot of somatic events in the tumor simply because they didn't have enough data to recognize that it's actually in the normal as well. Same issue for like de novo mutation studies and, and trios. You know, really, if you're looking for spontaneous mutation, you need a lot of coverage in the parents um, so that you can really believe that something you see in the kid that looks like it's spontaneous is really spontaneous. And that goes for structural variants, SNPs, and DELs, whatever. Um, we already touched upon this, uh, solving structural variants involving repetitive sequence are really, really hard to detect simply because there's lots of different alignments all over the genome, when, for instance, these retrotransposition events. Um, segmental duplications, they're also known as low copy repeats. You, know, you have non-allelic homologous recombination that, that leads to big duplications or big deletions, but we don't have... Uh, our sequencing technologies don't generate long enough reads or big enough fragments to be able to detect these things. Um, so this is this is the example I was showing just a minute ago, trying to where you have an insertion of a of a repetitive element in the test genome. You know, one end is going to align in the local region, and then the other end that reflects the inserted element. When it when you align it to the reference genome, there's multiple places that it can go to. Um, I just said this, uh, segmentally duplicated regions drive uh, structural variants through structural variation through non-allelic homologous recombination. Um, so when you get this, so you have these two big elements, they're duplicated and just, you know, when they're during recombination, they can slip and you can have recombination between this element and its non-allelic element, but highly identical adjacent element, leading to either a deletion or a duplication. And it's just we don't have, these, these elements tend to be at least 10 KB in size, so we don't have insert sizes from paradigm sequencing that are big enough to span these rearrangements. So really what the novel breakpoint is, is you know, spanning this whole thing. So the last secret is that, this isn't really a secret, complex structural variants in, especially in tumor genomes, but there's mounting evidence that this occurs in the germline as well. They 
generate ridiculously confusing and complex uh, breakpoint patterns that uh, this is something that we, we just published a paper on this a couple months ago in 64 cancer genomes. The prevalence is very much higher than we thought and we're sort of working on methods to take these crazy rearrangement patterns but in, what you really want to know is what does the derivative chromosome look like and what genes, what, what, what's effective, what's the functional consequence of these rearrangements. So here's a really, this is the simplest complex rearrangement where you've got an inversion that overlaps, well, actually, well, here's, here's the simplest, which is just an inversion, right? So there's, there's two breakpoints, but it's actually just one event. Um, so this is, this is just a single, single type of rearrangement that has two breakpoints, but here's a case where we've got multiple things going on. So on the top, uh, this is where I need a pointer. Is there a pointer? Yeah. Okay, close your eyes for a second while I figure this out. Okay. So. Oh, yeah. But, okay. Okay. All right. So this is the experimental chromosome. This is the reference genome. So but basically what we did in this study was we have all these discordant alignments from discordant paired end signal. And we basically took all this data and put it into a de novo assembler. And what we got out was this, this assembled contig that we could then align back to the reference genome. And the whole point of doing this was to, to align, the, to identify the rearrangement breakpoints at one base pair resolution. So here's a case where there's a deletion of this segment in the reference genome. There's also an inversion, and then there's another deleted segment. So this was sort of, this 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 was in the mouse genome, um, and this is the visualization. The same thing using uh, Savant, which you're going to learn about tomorrow, which gives a I think better better clues as to what's actually going on. Um, so. This led us to, to study complex rearrangements in other situations, and we had some early evidence of complex rearrangements in cancer, and there's, been, there's a long literature on, on this in cancer, but next-gen sequencing allowed us to map these at much higher resolution. So I, I don't have time to go into the real literature behind this, but there's a, there's a new proposed mechanism called chromothripsis. Some of you might have heard of it. Um, chromo, it, it means chromosome shattering. And the basic notion is that you, know, you see these complex rearrangements. So these are all breakpoints in this one part of, uh, I forget which chromosome this is, but this, this one segment of this one chromosome arm, 85% of the breakpoints in this tumor occurred right there. So yeah, there's a lot of rearrangement in the tumor, but it's focal. And the pattern suggests that this was one mutational event. It's not, you know, we think of cancer progression as, you know, you get it's you know selection in a cell in a cell population. We have a new mutation that occurs, confers some selective advantage. More mutation, more mutation. All these mutations occurred in the same event, um, and the idea is that the chromosome shattered, and for the cell to survive, the chromosome had to be put back together, right, through non-homologous end joining. So just essentially randomly, these fragments of DNA were put back together. So when you align that chromosome back to the reference genome, you get these ridiculous patterns. And I have no idea how to make sense of this. This is just drawing the data, right? Um, so we can use tools like Circos to draw these rearrangements. Um, so here's, here's basically the same event. Um, on chromosome 1, we have this focal, on chromosome 1, uh, focal rearrangement on this end. And these arcs represent rearrangements. And on this axis, what you see is changes in copy numbers. So these are losses, these are gains. And so again, I mean, we, we see that there's a lot of cool looking stuff, crazy, really hard to figure out, but it doesn't really yield much insight as to what the structure of the actual chromosome looked like. And so if you're interested in looking, about, looking at this a little more, we, we profiled 64 cancer genomes um, from TCGA looking at complex rearrangements and you know, made some basic conclusions, um, and I'll co come to those in a second, but here are six tumor genomes from uh, glioblastomas on the bottom, uh, squamous cell lung cancer, here's another glioblastoma, uh, and there's another lung cancer. 
Um, and basically what you see is that these complex rearrangements are fairly, fairly common. Um, we see them in a, a much higher fraction of tumor genomes than we expected. Um, and, and the main take home, the, the main result that we found is that glioblastomas and squamous cell lung cancers are hugely enriched for these chromothripsis like events. Not a lot of insight as to why as, as, at this point. Um, but also, there was some debate in the field about, you know, what are the mechanisms that lead to this. Um, some, some people argued that repli replicate, stalled replication forks would lead to these rearrangement patterns. The, the, the homology at the breakpoints that we see uh, suggests that it's actually non-homologous end joining, which suggests some mechanism for shattering the chromosome, and then you're using end joining to stitch the chromosome back together. But what we also saw was that these chromothripsis events are at a higher uh, allele frequency within each of the tumor, suggesting that either A, they confer some sort of selective advantage because they're at a higher frequency, or B, um, that they, they occurred early on in tumor genesis. Um, so I, there's a huge amount of work to figure out what's really driving these, what's the mechanism behind causing chromothripsis, why is it different among different cancer types, et cetera, but that's, that's future research. Okay, so in the last couple minutes, I'm just going to talk about the tools that we use, and then the lab, the lab that we're going to do, we're actually going to use the tools, but I just want to give you a, a really high-level sense of what tools there are out there. Um, as I mentioned, there's a ton. So I added on the on the wiki at the bottom of the front page. There's a like a resources, tips and tricks, or something. Um, one of the things that we'll add in there uh, today is, is some list, a list of some of the aligners and SNP callers and structural variant tools. But I also listed, there's two really nice web resources, Seek Answers and Biostars. I think we'll cover that a little bit more tomorrow. But here's a URL to this wiki page on Seek Answers that maintains a list of all the tools that are out there at your disposal for all these different tasks. And I just queried this wiki site to find this is, this is probably a third of the structural variant tools that are out there right now. Um, so there's a huge list. Um, refer to the first couple slides that I had about what some of the tools that we recommend that we have experience with and, and trust. Um, the one that we're going to use today is called Hydra. This is something I, I wrote when I was a postdoc. And the basic idea is that you... you um, you take these discordant alignments, these signatures that we've learned about, and, and you look for consistent evidence at a given locus for this, you know, the same pattern. So it's one thing to see lots of discordant alignments at a, re at a region, but if they don't agree with each other in terms of their mapping distance and the, the orientation of their ends, that suggests that it's probably not real. Whereas if you see lots of discordant alignments and they all suggest the same distance, they're all in the same orientation, that sort of separates the signal from the noise. This is a real event. So all Hydra does, it took us a long time to figure out how to do this quickly, but at the end of the day, saying what it does now, it sounds so simple. All we do is sweep across the genome, look for regions that have these clusters of discordant alignments. Once we find them, cluster them, and just tell you what the intervals are that the predictive breakpoint is in. Um, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to do that with um, NA12878 genome, and we're going to find all the structural variants that are on chromosome one of this individual. Um, so we also, for the cancer study I was talking about, we have a new version of Hydra called Hydra Multi that allows you to take hundreds and hundreds of genomes at once and use mutual information across those genomes to have better power to detect really rare uh, events in, in tumors, for instance, where maybe there's only two, two reads in the tumor so that if you analyze that tumor on its own, it wouldn't exceed the threshold that you that you would require to call the event. But if you see evidence in lots of other um, samples, it makes you believe that that event is real. It's just the same technology that people use for SNP calling, same concept. It's just applied to structural variant calling. And then this other tool that I'll let you look at on your own, uh, this is something that we're probably submitting this month. Uh, it's a tool called Lumpy, which um, I'll just highlight it really quickly. We talked about copy number, depth of coverage. We talked, talked about paired end mapping and split read mapping, all these three different primary signals for structural variation. 
The reality is that until this, well, till the end of last year, every tool that was out there only looked at one of those signals. And so we talked about you know, low sensitivity or high false negative rate. One of the main reasons for that is most of the tools out there just didn't use all the signal that was available to them. And the reasons for that are because there's some technical challenges to doing that. That's what this, this framework that we developed solves so we can integrate split read mapping, paradigm mapping, any signal into the same probabilistic framework. And the consequence is that um, we have much higher sensitivity. So we find more of the real events and we don't, we don't increase our false positive rate. So we're pretty excited about that tool first because one of the ongoing projects in our lab is, is um, studying complex rearrangements in cancer. So we need good tools to, to find these events. Okay, so with that, I will end. The last slides are some more details about that tool if you're interested.